So one question to ask ourselves is, what is engineering? Okay, how do we define uh, what is engineering? Well, the definition I like to use is one put forth by Steve Centuria, um, a, one of our professors who's now uh, retired. He defined engineering to be the purposeful use of science. All right, so then what is 6002 about? So 6002 is the first course in engineering, and I like to view 6002 as the gainful employment of Maxwell's equations. Okay, many of you have seen Maxwell's equations uh, before. Uh, most of you should have. And they're hard stuff. Okay, 6002 is all about teaching you how to simplify our lives, make things simple, so we can gainfully employ Maxwell's equations gamefully employ uh, the facts of nature to build very interesting systems. So let me show you how that transition is made. <clears throat> so uh, there's the world around us, nature, and so we make some observations in nature. Uh, we make measurements, and we can write down large tables of measurements. So for example, we can take objects and uh, measure the voltage across them and look at the resulting current through the elements. So we may end up getting a bunch of values such as <clears throat> So we start out life with making measurements on what exists. And we build a bunch of tables. Now, we could directly take these tables and based on our observations in these tables, we could go ahead and build very interesting, engineer interesting systems that help us out in day-to-day uh, -day lives. But that's incredibly hard. Imagine having to resort to a set of tables to do any kind of useful work. So what we do as engineers is we first layer a level of abstraction. Okay? We look at all this data and somehow layer an abstraction such that we can simplify or much more succinctly put in a simple equation or in a simple statement what these numbers are telling us. Okay? So, for example, our physics laws. So laws of physics, for example, are simply abstractions. The laws are abstractions. So these sets of numbers can be codified by Ohm's law, for example. V is equal to Ri, the voltage current, uh, relates to the resistance of the object. So uh, V is equal to Ri is a law that succinctly describes the set of experiments, okay? A, and replaces a large number of tables with a very simple statement. You could call this a law, or you could call it an abstraction. Okay, so you've seen laws of physics. Um, call them abstractions of physics, if you like. Similarly, there are Maxwell's equations, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so this is what is. Okay, this is out there. Okay, and our laws and abstractions describe the properties of nature as we see it in some succinct form. Now, if you want to go and build useful things, uh, we could take these abstractions, uh, take Ma Maxwell's equations, and go and build things. But it's hard. It's really, really hard. And what you will learn in RMIT is this place is all about simplifying things. Okay, take complicated things, build layers of abstraction, simplify things so that we can build useful systems. Okay, even in 6002, we start life by making a huge leap from Maxwell's equations to a, very, to a couple of very, very simple laws. Okay, I'm going to show you that leap that we're going to make uh, today. So the first set of, the first abstraction that we layer is called the lumped circuit abstraction. Okay, and in the lumped circuit abstraction, what we do is we make a set of simplifications that allows us to view a set of objects as discrete or lumped elements. So we may uh, we'll define uh, voltage sources, we'll define resistors, we'll define capacitors, and so on. Okay, and I'm going to make this jump and show you how we make this jump in a few minutes. So on that on that sort of abstractions, we then layer yet another abstract layer. And let me call that the, the amplifier abstraction. Okay, remember, 
here we are absolutely down and dirty. We're sitting with probes, measuring objects, and building huge tables. We abstracted things into simple laws, and life got a little better. Okay, I'm going to show you you can abstract things further out and build discrete objects, and then you can build even more interesting components called amplifiers and begin playing around with amplifiers. Okay, so when you're using amplifiers, you don't really have to worry about the details of Maxwell's equations. Okay, I'll give you some very simple abstract rules of behavior for an amplifier, and you can go build very interesting systems without really, really knowing how Maxwell's equations applies, uh, applies to that because you will be working at this abstract layer. However, since you're engineers and you're going to be building such systems, it's very important for you to understand how we make this leap from laws of physics into some of our very primitive engineering abstractions. <clears throat> so once we make the amplified abstraction in 6002, by the way, 6002 starts here. We start from the laws of physics and then proceeds all the way out. <clears throat> so uh, once we talk about amplifiers, we will take two pads. On the amplifier, we will build the next abstraction called the digital abstraction. Okay, and with the digital abstraction, we will build new elements such as inverters and combinational gates. Okay, so notice we're building bigger and bigger things which have more and more complicated behavior inside them, but which are very simple to describe. All right, so following the digital abstraction, we will superpose the combinational logic abstraction on top of that and define functional blocks that look like this. Some inputs, some function, some outputs. The next abstraction on top of that will be the clocked digital abstraction where we will have some notion of time introduced into the system. There'll be a clock and this will be some function and there'll be a clock that introduces time into the set of logic values that functions operate upon. Following that, the next level of abstraction that we build is called the instruction set abstraction. Okay, now you begin to see things that consumers get to look at. Uh, can someone give me an example of a instruct or name of an instruction set or an instruction set abstraction? X86, bingo. Okay, so x86 is one set of abstractions. And in fact, in many universities, in many universities, education could well start just by saying, okay, here's an abstraction. These are the x86 instructions, okay? Some MIT gurus have designed this awesome little microprocessor, okay? So you just worry about, you take this abstraction layer here, these assembly instructions, and you go and build systems on top of that. Okay, so this is an abstraction layer called the x86 layer. There are other uh, abstraction layers. In um, 6004, you will learn about, uh, I believe, the alpha or the beta, okay, and various other abstractions at this point. So 6002 kind of goes until here. 6002 takes you from the world of physics all the way to the world of interesting analog and digital systems. Okay, 004, the course on computation structures will show you how to build computers all the way from uh, uh, simple digital objects all the way to uh, big systems. Following that, you learn about uh, language abstractions, Java, C, and other languages. And that's in 6002. And there are a set of other courses that uh, will cover that. Following this, you learn about software system abstractions. And software systems, you will learn about operating systems. Any example of an operating system abstraction that uh, people know out there? What's that? Linux. What else? I'm just wondering how long I will have to go until I hear what I want to hear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we have a bunch of software systems. These are nothing but abstractions. Linux simply implies a set of system calls that your program is supposed to adhere to. Windows is another set of system calls. That's it. And see how much money they made out of it. Okay? It's all about abstraction layers. 
Okay, it all starts from nature, all right? Build up abstraction upon abstraction upon abstraction upon abstraction, and somewhere out here are lots of dollars. <laughs> okay, so, um, so based on these abstractions, we can then build useful things for human beings. We can build, uh, you know, very useful things. Video games, okay? So, okay, we can send... Uh, Space shuttles up and you know a whole bunch of other systems, but it's based on these abstraction layers. What's unique about the education at MIT? What's unique about 6002 and EECS? Is to my knowledge, there are not many other places in the world where you will be educated, you will get an education in everything going all the way from nature to how to build very complicated analog and digital systems. Okay, we will show you layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, peel away the onion until you're down to raw nature. Okay, through Maxwell's equations, to so 6002, 004, this is 033, okay, uh, uh, 6170, and so on. Okay, the, the whole EECS is about building abstraction layers one on top of the other. So that's the one path. There's the analog path. The analog path to take an amplifier and build an abstraction layer called the op amp. See how similar they all look? You know the amplifier, the inverter in the digital world, and the operational amplifier in the analog world. Just slightly different ways of looking at the same, same devices. So to build analog systems, we build an uh, operational amplifier. And then here we go end up building a whole bunch of interesting analog system components. OK, and these components might look like oscillators. They might look like filters. Okay, they look like uh, power supplies. A whole bunch of very interesting abstract components, which pulled together can then give you your next set of uh, systems. And these systems might be toasters. All right, or uh, uh, say for example, other analog systems like uh, you know uh, various control various control systems for various power plants and so on and so forth, and ultimately, you know, fun and dollars. Okay, so, uh, so 6002 is about going from physics all the way to this point, where we, where we build interesting analog systems and take you all the way up to a uh, interesting digital system component from which 004 will take you all the way to building computer architectures. So that, in a nutshell, kind of gives you a feel for the space of EECS. OK, this chart here is almost a vignette of what EECS at MIT is all about. And this is, you know, this is the world according to Agarwal, because he's teaching 002. OK, so you know, this, is, this is 6002, and the rest of EECS is you know, uh, somewhere out there. OK, so what I'm going to do now is throughout this course, I want you to think about which part in this vignette we are in. So right now, I'm going to start here and take you here. Okay, and as we get closer and closer, things get simpler and simpler and simpler. Till the final abstractions are pedal, brake, steering wheel. I and mean, that's the abstraction to play a game, right? The four or five very simple interfaces, and that's all you need to know. And everybody in the world can play stuff. So remember, this stuff is complicated. This stuff is very, very simple. Okay, and the more we build abstractions and come to this side, things get simpler and simpler. So a large part of what I'll cover today is make the biggest simplification. The biggest simplification we will make is go from Maxwell's equation to, a very, to some very, very simple algebraic rules. Okay, I did Maxwell's equations myself. And I tell you, they were very interesting stuff, but complicated. I can't imagine building systems using Maxwell's equations. So uh, let's take an example, OK? So let's say, let's say I have a battery. OK, so switch to page three of your uh, course notes. And let's say I connect that to a bulb. Okay, and this is a wire. 
and the battery supplies some voltage V. And I ask you a simple question. What is the current through the bulb? Okay, so here is something that I can build using objects. You know, I can pick around uh, uh, from stores and so on. And I can connect them up in this way and ask the question, what is the current I? Now, if all you've done is learned about Maxwell's equations, you can roll up your sleeves and say, aha, the first step is to write down all of Maxwell's equations. And you can say, you know, a del cross E is a minus del. And go on and on and on. Okay? And write all of Maxwell's equations and say, now, how do I, you know, uh, how do I get from there to here? Okay, it's very, you can do it. Okay, you can do it, but it's very complicated. Okay, so instead what we're going to do is take the easy way. So what I want to remind you is that this course is actually very easy. Okay, remember, we're going to be building abstraction upon abstraction to make your lives easier. If you think your lives are getting more complicated, then you're not using intuition enough. Okay, just remember the big I word. Okay, it's all about making things simple. Okay, so um, let me give, give you an analogy. So suppose you have an object, okay, and I apply a force to the object. It's an analogy, okay, to get some insight into how to do this. <clears throat> so I say, here's an object, I apply a force, and I ask you the question, what is the acceleration of the object when I apply a force F? So how would you do it? Okay, eighth or ninth or tenth grader can do this. Uh, they would ask me, what's the mass of the object? Okay, I ask you, what is the acceleration? You turn around and ask me, what is the mass of the object? I tell you the mass of the object is m. And then you say, ah, sure, a is f divided by m. Done. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> okay, I... I Does anybody remember this? Point mass simplification. Okay? So uh, in physics, you've done this before. Okay, you've simplified your lives by viewing objects as, a objects as having a mass at a point and forces acting at that point. Okay, M is that property of the object that is of interest to you. This process is called, in physics, point Point mass discretization. Okay? Now, use that analogy, and I'm going to show you a similar simple process to do the, uh, the problem with the uh, light bulb. Okay. So, uh, so take my light bulb again. and I focus on the filament of the light bulb, okay? All I care about is the current flowing through the light bulb, okay? I don't care about whether these wires, whether the filament is twisted, whether it's hot. I don't care about its shape. I don't care about its color. All I care about is the current, okay? So to do that, what we can do here at a very high level is since we just need the current and don't care about a bunch of other properties, we will simply replace the bulb with the discrete object called the resistor. Okay, so the discrete object is a resistor, much like the point mass uh, simplification that we did earlier. It replaced the big the bulb filament with a uh, object called the resistor, as a discrete object called the resistor, or a lumped object called the resistor, and put a value next to it, just like the mass for the object, a resistance value R. Okay, now what I can do is in the same manner, replace the battery with an object called a battery object and connect that here. The voltage V applied to it. V falls across the resistor. 
and I get my i simply as from Ohm's law as v divided by r. Okay, so notice here we replace this complicated bulb, this really twisty weirdo thing, with this discrete thing called a resistor, and its only property of interest was its resistance value r. Direct analogy to what we did, what we did there. So since R represent the only, represents the only property of interest, we can simply ignore all the other things. So you notice here, we've done things the simple way. Okay? And remember, in EE, in electrical engineering, we do things the simple way. Okay? We could go the hard route and do Maxwell's equations okay? and get PhD, uh, uh, PhDs in physics and so on. But out here, we're looking to do useful, interesting systems in the simplest way that we can. Okay? We do things the simple way. All right, so we just did this, and boom, I found out what the current was. Now, I've cheated a little bit. <clears throat> I've cheated a little bit. R is a lumped abstraction for the bulb. <clears throat> so when you look at this resistor here, that is simply a placeholder. It's a stand-in for this complicated thing called a bulb. It's a discrete object. It's a lumped object, and represents the bulb. <clears throat> Now, before we, so most of 6002 will take off from here. Okay, and that's it. To very simple stuff like V is equal to IR. That's, it's a simple high school algebra. We'll take off in that direction. But before we go there, it's important to understand why was it that we were able to make this simplification? Okay, we did something else here. Something's going on under the covers here. Okay, on the one hand, I say, let's use Maxwell's, and then I jump about and say, hey, we can just use a simple thing. I did something that allowed me to go from here to here, okay? And you need to understand why I did that and how I did that. Understand it once, and then you won't have to need that information again. You just need to understand it. <clears throat> so let's uh, take a closer look at the bulk filament and look at what we really did. So here's my filament, A. And let's say that... Uh, the surface area here, I label that S A, and the one down here as uh, B. My voltage uh, V applied there, and this is what I call my black box that I replaced with a resistor. <clears throat> Notice that in order for this to work, V and I need to be defined. So I needs to be defined, and V needs to be defined. Okay, if I give you a random object, and I don't tell you anything else about the object, it's not clear I can do that. Okay, if it's a much more general situation, I have to write down Maxwell's equations, and you know, this is what I would write down. Write down J dot D as a current, uh, you know, as a function of uh, uh, the coordinate here, integrated over the area, minus Okay, I would have to start from there. Okay, from uh, one of Maxwell's equations. All right, notice that this becomes IA and this becomes IB in our simplification. But if I don't tell you anything else, you have to start from here. You might have some kind of varying current here by, uh, you know, uh, by point. Uh, you might have some other current coming out here because uh, I may have uh, some charge buildup happening inside. If charge was building up inside the filament, then I would have to put del Q by del T out here, right? The current in minus the current out must equal charge buildup. Whoa. Where is this and where is that? This stuff is too hard. Let's make the assumption that all the systems that we will consider will have this thing be zero. Okay, in other words, that if I take a, a complete object, like if I take an element, like a resistor or a capacitor, put a box around the entire element, okay? I want to just view, just deal with those systems in which this thing is zero. 
You can come and beat me up and say, but why? Why not? Why, why am I doing this? And I'm saying, you know, the world is arbitrary. I'm an engineer. I want to build good systems. By making the simplification, I eliminate this, you know, this, this, this squiggle thing and so on, you know. I don't want to deal with it. I want to make my life simple. So this has gone to zero. Because why? Because I have said that in future, I will only deal with those elements, okay, for which this is true. I am going to discipline myself. I am going to discipline myself to only deal with those systems. Okay, Maxwell's turning around and, you know, mad at me and all that stuff, but tough. So this, what I've said is I'm making a simplification here, and this is a, one of the simplifications I'm making, and I give, give a name to the simplification, and that's called the lumped matter, lumped matter discipline. Okay, so I'm saying I'm only going to deal with elements for which if I put a black box around it, this is going to be true. And when this is going to be true, then notice there is no charge buildup. Current in must, must equal current out. Aha, so this becomes IA, this becomes IB, yes. Okay, I can now deal with IAs and IBs. And IA and IB are equal because this is zero. Notice that there's a whole bunch of depth here in the jump from here to here. Okay, as MIT uh, uh, graduates, you really, really need to understand why it is that we made that jump. And then go and use that and you know, do cool things. <clears throat> All right. This allows us to define an I. We have a unique I associated with an element for the current through the element. We still have to worry about B, and I won't go through that in detail. Uh, the course notes have some discussion of that, and so does the uh, so does the textbook. So V. So V A B is defined when <coughs> del phi B, the uh, rate of change of uh, magnetic flux, is zero. So if I take the element and I take any region outside the element, this must be true. And you say, why should that be true? That's not true in general. Absolutely, it's not true in general. But I, because I choose to, I'm going to deal with only those elements. I'm going to discipline myself to deal with only those elements for which this is true and this is true. I'm going to limit my world. I'm going to, I'm going to create a play field for myself. If you want to play, follow my rules. Okay? And that's called the lump matter discipline. So once you say that I'm going to adhere to the lump matter discipline, and this is true inside your elements. This is true outside the elements. You can define VA and VB, and good things happen to you. Okay, let me show you a few uh, examples of lumped elements. But remember, a large part of uh, what we're doing is based on these two assumptions. And, uh, and to just go through the background on that, I would encourage you to go to chapter one of... Uh, your course notes and uh, read through uh, just as uh, how this came about, how uh, that comes about. So by doing that, by adhering to the lump matter discipline, we can now lump objects. We can lump a bulb into a resistor. Okay, so we create a certain number of lumped objects, and now our universe is going to be comprised of lumped objects. So before this, you know, when you when you went home, you talked about eggs and omelets and light bulbs and switches. But once you come to MIT and after you've taken 6002, you begin talking about lumped elements, you know, resistors, voltage sources, capacitors, those little inky-dinky objects that follow the lump matter discipline. Okay, and they, 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 they stick to very simple rules, and they're math, and the math that you have to do to analyze them is incredibly simple. Okay, well, what can be simpler than V is equal to IR? So let me, let me give you an example of a bunch of uh, interesting lumped elements, and then show you a couple of really nasty lumped elements. Okay. I'm gonna switch to that and I made a mistake. Okay. So what you see out here, so we characterize lumped elements by the VI characteristics. Okay? We apply a voltage, measure the current. Okay, so what I can do is I can plot I here and V here and see what it looks like. Okay, I can characterize elements by their VI 
relationship. And a bunch of elements that I can create based on the VI relationship. So let me show you a few examples. So for the resistor, since V is directly proportional to I, and R is a constant, I get a straight line. That's I, the I axis, the V axis, and this is a resistor. What I actually have is a variable resistor, so I'm going to change the resistance value R, and the curve will also change slope. Okay, I change the value R because it's a variable resistor, and it changes slope because my R is different. Okay, next. Let me go to uh, a fixed resistor, and uh, this guy here on the uh, screen to your uh, left, I guess, is a fixed resistor. And you see that uh, its IV characteristic is a line of uh, a given slope, 1 by R, and that's it. I can't change it. Number three, I have another lumped element called a Zener diode that you will see in the fourth week of this class. And the characteristics for the Zener diode look like this, IV. If my voltage goes across the Zener diode goes up slightly, the current shoots up. But if the voltage becomes negative, I don't have any current flowing through it until the voltage passes some threshold at which point my current begins to build up. Okay? So you can increase the current a little, increase the voltage a little bit, and you can show that the current starts building up again. So that's, a, that's another interesting lumped element called a Zener diode. Let's switch to a next one called a diode. So diode looks like this, I, V. If the voltage across the diode becomes positive, around 0.6 volts or thereabout, current begins to shoot up. But if the voltage is below that threshold of 0.6, then my current is almost zero. It's another lumped element called a diode. And you will begin using these elements in your 002 lives to build interesting systems. Um, next example is a thermistor. A thermistor is a resistor whose resistance varies with temperature. Okay? So uh, this is a... Uh, very expensive, uh, this is a very expensive uh, little uh, dryer, hair dryer. And uh, what I'm going to do is blow some hot air at my resistor, and uh, you're going to see that its value is going to change depending on how much I heat it. So as, as it cools down, let me cool it down. <laughs> so you can see it's coming down. I can, I can zap it again. I could do this all day. This is so much fun. <laughs> okay. So, so, that's a, um, so that's another interesting lumped element. As the temperature uh, rises, its resistance changes. <clears throat> next, next thing is called a, next thing is a photoresistor. Okay? It's a resistor. It used to be a resistor, Lorenzo. Oh, okay. That's fine. So, so this is a photoresistor. And notice that uh, it almost behaves like an open circuit. What I'm going to do is shine some light on it. When I shine light, light on it, it begins to conduct and becomes a resistor of some value. There you go. Okay? So uh, that's a uh, photoresistor. So now I'm going to show you a battery. Notice uh, we did talk about batteries before. I'll show you a battery. So before I show a battery, just think in your own minds, what should the IV characteristic of a battery look like? I V, a battery supplies a constant voltage. You know your little cell, your AA battery, 1.5 volts. So think about what, what the IV characteristic of a battery should look like for three seconds before I show it to you. So when I show it, Lorenzo? It's a straight line. This is a good battery. It's a straight vertical line which says that the voltage is 1.5 volts or thereabouts, no matter what current it supplies. As an ideal voltage source, it has a fixed voltage, V, and no matter what the current going through is. Now I'll show you a dud, a bad battery. And this is what a bad battery looks like. So uh, many of you have had uh, your car batteries die on you. And when you, when you go to the store, they check your batteries. They use exactly this principle, that dead batteries have resistance. Whenever you see slopes here, you get res you're thinking of resistance. Okay, they can use this property to figure out that your battery is dead. So that's a dead battery. And finally, let me show you a bulb. Uh, we started with a bulb, and so I need to end. Okay. We started with a bulb, so I need to end with a bulb. And what you'll see is that 
a bulb is simply uh, behaves like a resistor, its IV curve is going to look like is going to look like this. Okay, notice this is my bulb, and guess what? It's, it behaves like a resistor. It's a very interesting kind of resistor, so I won't go into details for now. But notice its IV characteristic behaves like a resistor. Okay. So that those are some pretty standard lumped elements. You learn, a, you, you, you'll, you'll deal with a lot more set of uh, lumped elements, switches, MOSFETs, capacitors, inductors, a bunch of other fun stuff. But before we do that, what I want to tell you is that don't go berserk on this abstraction binge. Okay? Too much of anything is bad for you. So what I'm going to show you is <clears throat> abstractions or models are only valid provided you work within a set of constraints. Notice we have the, we've already had this tacit handshake which said that we'll follow the follow this discipline. Okay? Even after we follow this discipline, there are ranges to how well physical elements can behave like ideal lumped elements. Okay? For example, what I'm going to do is show you a resistor. And uh, it's going to look like a resistor. I'm going to keep increasing the voltage around it. Okay, what's going to happen at some point? I just keep doing that. If it's an ideal element, if you're a theorist, you say, oh, yeah, the, the curve will keep extending until I reach infinity. But this is a practical resistor, so, uh, you know. So but people out, out here kind of cover your eyes or something. Okay? So uh, your abstraction... Your abstraction can predict that. <laughs> All it says the current is an amp. It can predict the heat, light, or the smell. Okay, so in the laboratory, when you get the smell, you know what somebody has just done. <laughs> They've blown the So that's one example of a, the lumped abstraction breaking down. So um, you know, if I really believe in my own BS, anything's a lumped element, so here's a pickle. <laughs> A pickle's a lumped element. I can treat it as a lumped resistor. But this is a very interesting lumped resistor. <laughs> Don't try this at home. This is a standard pickle into which we are pumping uh, 110 volts uh, AC. And, uh, I promise you, this is a standard pickle. So it, it, has a, it has a fixed resistance, but your lumped abstraction cannot predict the nice light and sound effect. So, uh, <clears throat> okay, so the last two or three minutes, what I want to do... <clears throat> so remember, don't get carried away by abstractions. There are limits. Okay, you can't predict everything. Okay? That's the smell of a pickle. <clears throat> okay. So let me give you a preview of some upcoming attractions and show you one more quick simplification in the last, in the last two minutes. So what we can do... Once we build these lumped elements, we can connect them in circuits. Okay, so I can build a circuit of this sort. So here's a voltage source, a bunch of resistors. I can connect them with wires and build a circuit of this sort. <clears throat> One interesting question we can ask ourselves is under the lumped matter discipline, what can we say about the voltages. Okay, if I go around this loop, provided my world adheres to the lump matter discipline, what can I say about the voltages around this loop? You can say, aha, Maxwell again, right? So I can write Maxwell's uh, appropriate equation to solve that. Okay, the, um, voltages have something to do with E and your integral of E dot DL and all of that stuff, right? So this is the appropriate Maxwell's equation uh, to use. And I want to find out what happens here. Now remember, under LMD, I made the assumption. Okay, my world, my playground, has del phi b by del t being zero. The rate of change of flux is zero. So uh, under these circumstances, I can write I can write this. I can break up this line integral into three parts across the voltage source and across the two resistors and write that down. Okay? And then what I can do is now that the right-hand side is zero, I can simply take this, and I know that E dot dl across this element is simply Vca. This is Vab, and this is Vbc equals zero. 
Okay, so when I make the assumption that del phi b by del t is zero, and I go around this loop applying Maxwell's equations, what do I find? I find that the sum of the voltages VCA plus VAB plus VBC is zero. That's fantastic. So now I can say hasta la vista to this baby here. Okay, and I can focus on this guy and say Maxwell's equation, this thing with squiggles and you know dells and all that stuff, can be simplified to the sum of the voltages or the sum of the voltages across a set of elements in a loop in a circuit is zero. Okay, and this is called Kirchhoff's first law, KVL. Okay, similarly in the recitation section, you'll see uh, the application of Kirchhoff's current law, which comes from this being equal to zero and all the currents coming into a node being zero. So KVL and KCL directly come out of the lump matter discipline. And we can use those to solve circuits like this.